Hi everyone and welcome to another IT seminar. Today I am happy to introduce our speaker Saeed Shakib uh, who will be presenting his work on residential location behavior in Greater Toronto area. Uh, Saeed is a fourth year PhD student here at University of Toronto and he's working under the supervision of Professor Khanka Nurul Habib. His research focuses on location choice modeling and survey design methods. He earned his master's and bachelor's degree at the Sharif University of Technology in Iran. So welcome, Saeed, and the virtual floor is all yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Saeed, and I want to present to you today uh, the latest work that we had on on server design on residential relocation choice behavior. If I wanna give you an outline for today's presentation, uh, just to let you know what is going to happen in the next 40 minutes, um, I'll start off with a very quick review of the study that we have and the whole study is based on a very bigger study. I'll quickly review that and introduce what research question is behind our study and what approach did we take to answer that research question and uh, where are we at now in regards of answering that question. Um, and then I'll talk about how based on the approach, you will see that there's like a two stage uh, survey going on on location choice. I'll talk about the challenges that we experienced in the first, uh, uh, first cycle. And we'll, I'll show you that how uh, the first cycle is pretty the standard practice that is happening right now in the literature. And what are the challenges that we face and we think everyone else uh, collecting data on location choice is facing. And how does that justify and gives us the motivation to think about better ways to get better data in location choice data collection? And then um, the third part of the sec uh, presentation uh, will introduce the method that we came up with to get better data uh, for location choice, uh, choice experiment design. And that will follow up with some evidence from the data that how we actually have better data. And uh, just to show you if, if this um, efficient adaptive survey design that we are proposing is working better or not. And after that, once we have data for both cycles, first cycle and second cycle, uh, first cycle happened in July 2020, and the second cycle happened in July 2021. That gives us uh, a good um, checkpoints for comparing the residential relocation behavior between two, uh, two times, two different times in the uh, pandemic. And then um, at the end, there will be a little bit short discussions on how this type of data that we're gathering will improve the modeling practices um, and how it can be used to get, uh, to get its best potential. Uh, the audience for this presentation is uh, set to be those who are interested in survey designs in uh, maybe location choice modeling, and also those who are like curious about knowing how the re uh, relocation behavior has changed in two different timelines of the pandemic. Uh, so I'll start with the uh, project background. Um, well, the, the whole study is being built on uh, the hierarchical transportation decision-making that um, and, and the foundation of that people have lifestyles and those lifestyles will lead to them making decisions that have um, consequences in different um, time periods. So we have long-term uh, mobility decisions such as location choice, workplace choice, um, um, and any sort of location choice and land use. Um, and we have midterm choices like the, ch the, cho uh, the choice that if somebody wants to buy a car or not. And then we have short term uh, choices that um, 
that goes under the category of scheduling, um, what, what trips that people want to make and how uh, they, they want to make it. And in and, and the literature of transportation, you see that uh, m- these researchers are being connected to each other as how these different choices are going to affect each other and these um, relationships is somehow being the backbone and the foundation of the demand analysis that we do for transportation. But then the pandemic happened and obviously we wanted to see how the pandemic would change each of these decisions um, and consequently change the demand of uh, transportation for future. Pandemic had its own direct effects on, on each of these choices. We, we saw streets were empty for a while. Uh, very, uh, we, we see that the purchases of house is like decreased significantly, same for car ownership. And also we saw that it, pandemic is um, is causing the people uh, exposed to new activities such as telecommuting uh, e-shopping e-learning and in long term we were curious that if if through that period no matter how long it's going to be is it going to affect the each one of these choices uh, in the future or not and my uh, my part in this project and uh, was focusing on the household residential location choices and the effect of pandemic on, on those choices. So the questions from my part that I have to answer is, uh, what, what were the immediate impacts of um, COVID-19 pandemic on changing household uh, preferences um, and for, for their residential location choice? geographically and also dwelling type choices. Is, are there going to be any patterns uh, that we are going to observe anytime soon or not? And if the relocation behavior is being changed, how that changed, what, what are the new factors? If we had any previous factors that we thought it's important in uh, households residential relocation, is that going to be changed? Uh, like some of the factors are going to be more significant or less significant. And the second question that needs to be answered here is if we observe uh, change of uh, relocation behavior during the pandemic, is this going to last after the pandemic or is this going to just fade away over time and people will get back to what preferences they had before that? So to answer those questions, uh, we decided um, to to design our own study and go into the field and see uh, what, what answers can we find for those questions. Um, we so imagine uh, no matter how long the pandemic period will be, uh, we have we have a time period, and our um, our approach was uh, um, going put, setting some checkpoints in that period and. In those checkpoints, we go to the field, we see, uh, we, we collect data and we observe, we try to observe relocation behavior at that time point. And we, our uh, idea is to keep continuing this until the pandemic is relevant to people's lifestyle. So at, so, so far we had two cycles. First one, like I said, it was in July, 2020. And the second one's uh, in July, 2021. And during those checkpoints, uh, the data that we collected and observed uh, once we went into the field was overall demographic uh, characteristics of households, um, like the age, gender, number of people residing in household, what is the form of the household, is this like adults living together, family, single people, and then we gathered information on their current residence and the fact that like, what region are you living in right now? What, re- what, what is a dwelling type? Do you think, are you living in a quiet area, green area? Are, do, you, do you find transit accessible to your residence or not? Just to collect information on their current residence and then build, it on, uh, build our choice experiment uh, by putting those people into 
decision making scenarios to see how how will they make their choices under uh, when they have uh, different alternatives. And then that follow up followed up by general pandemic behavior, just in case that we can connect any of those behavior to recent pandemic uh, lifestyle that they had. So I'll uh, go through the first cycle very quick. Uh, we had uh, like some, um, some interesting observations and modeling practice in the first cycle. Um, but I decided to put all of these in the background section, mainly because I wanna talk about what we did in the second cycle regarding the data collection. And then I will, um, which will come up in the next parts. Uh, so the first cycle was in July 2020, uh, stage two of reopening. If you don't remember vividly, uh, we could only do dinings, recreational activities out, outdoors. Uh, malls were open with restricted capacity. Local stores were like curbside picking. No vaccinations. We only experienced one wave at that time. And um, that was... Uh, so. And the scope of the study for that time for us was trying to figure out uh, if the people gonna move from urban areas to suburban areas and which suburban area to which suburban area or urban area. So we divided the, um, the area of the study GTA to these sections and our goal was provide options to people uh, for each of these sections and give different attributes to those uh, alternatives and see if people are more incli inclined to choose um, certain dwelling type region or uh, any other attribute that could be uh, significant. Uh, because this study is going to be followed up by uh, my discussion on the new experiment design, I will more uh, mostly focus on the experiment design aspect of the first study. Well, just to give you a very quick review on, uh, on, on the things that we could do on getting uh, location choice data, there are two main practices. First is reveal preference, and the second is uh, stated preference. Reveal preference is when you go out and ask people, uh, when if, if ask, ask them the recent relocation, uh, residential relocation they had. You, you, you will go and ask what options that you had, what, what were the reasons you chose this place. And since people usually don't very vividly remember all the choices that they did not choose at the time, they are living in their current residence. Um, revealed preference is um, usually considered as limited uh, and unreliable data source for location choice. Another option is uh, using hypothetical scenarios where we, we make uh, choice, de decision-making scenario for people and observe how they are making their choices inside that scenario. Um, well, the, the, the downside of that is, uh, is that thing is hypothetical, but the reason that we had to do this for this specific study is, um, well, it was already two or three months in the pandemic and uh, relocations were very, were very low at that time. People were not moving and us going out and ask, find people who, who are moving in that two or three months, it would be a very um, unrealistic way of uh, us doing the research. So we, we ended up uh, designing the state of preference and putting pandemic status in it and see how would people make their relocation choices based on the attributes of the uh, um, residents and the pandemic status. And for stated preference, um, well, the main tasks are just selecting the attribute you wanna have in your choice set. And once you have those uh, attributes, um, you have to come up with designs with, with, with your choice experiments to, to present them to the respondents of the, to participants of the survey, uh, survey. And then your goal would be getting the most information out of the uh, survey 
by having a good design for your SB. There are two main ways to do DSB. One is factorial design that tries to uh, consider all of the combinations of factors and put them in the uh, uh, survey. But since we have so many attributes, so many, uh, and we're dealing with location choice with so many uh, choices, we had to go with another design that is called efficient. Efficient is that you, you, you based on pair year studies, uh, studies that was be uh, held before, you, you get an overall idea of what is the um, preferences. You get a guess, you, you have a good guess on, on what is the preferences of people for, for uh, making their relocation choice. And you define that as a model and you, Based on that model, you design a, a set of questions that will maximize the information you will get out of the survey. So it's, a, it's an optimization problem. You solve that, you predefine your choice, uh, your uh, experiment designs, you run the study, you see how people make their choices in that uh, efficient design. One thing I wanna talk about before moving on from this section is uh, the orthogonality in those designs. Uh, since you are hypothesizing cases and you're presenting the, the choice environment to the people, you, you want to be as unbiased as you can. For example, if you design a study that you have uh, where the, let's say detached houses alternatives outweigh the other uh, choices and uh, like let's say condos, semi-detached and townhouses, if you do that type of study, um, you, your results will likely be biased towards uh, detached houses because you put more detached options out there and people ended up choosing it more. So you balance things out. You, you, you control that you are evenly sending out all the attributes to, uh, to the uh, uh, choice experiments and people are making their decision in a balanced environment. Uh, and a, that practice will lead to a table like this. Well, this is just a sample of the choice experiment. And I know dropping it into a slide like this might look a little bit complicated uh, for you, but in, in a survey, the respondents will go through a preparation part in the survey and we clarify things that what, what are the things, what are the attributes we define here? We go through them one by one to make sure that everyone understands these. And people make this, uh, make the decisions based on these tables after knowing the basics. Uh, so in our survey, we had these attributes in the first cycle and uh, we designed 18 pre-designed uh, pre experiments and each person randomly faced nine of them and we collected the data based on that. And people make their decision based on three different pandemic conditions. One was going back to normal, two was adapting to new normal, where everything is based on social distancing and uh, just following the protective measures. And the third condition was going to another lockdown after another wave or another pandemic. So we collected the data. I'm not going to talk about the first cycle a lot, which I already, I think, talked about it 20 minutes, but it was a very standard practice. You collected the data based on DSP. You go, um, um, you clean your data. You come up with uh, a relatively complicated model to fit your data to the model to be able to publish it nowadays. And, um, and the, at the end of the day, in your paper, you will see um, you'll say this study uses SB data collected in region X at year Y. And here's our complicated model. We made this um, crazy assumption for the error term, which led to um, this structure. And we, made, we fitted the data to our model and these are our results. For our case, we did a binary mixed cross nested logit model, which the goal of this structure is to first, uh, making a difference between uh, residential mobility, which is in the literature means whether the person wants to relocate or not. And 
reloc and location choice, which is uh, in the literature means after that person decided to enter the market to make the uh, relocation decision, you want to see where that place is uh, making uh, where that place is going to end up uh, going. And cross nested because we we wanted to know if a person is moving to a certain location, is it because of they want to move to a certain dwelling type or a certain region? So we, we didn't want to put any nest above the other nest. So we put those nests parallelly next to each other and we made joint choices of those. I don't want to discuss the numbers of this model, but I will just give you a, a, like a overall findings uh, of that first cycle. Uh, we observed that households are unwilling to relocate under uncertain pandemic conditions. Uh, well, based on the sign and the magnitude of COVID status variable, we found out that people are more likely to make their relocation decisions when things are going back to normal. And they are not willing to make the decisions on under lockdown and uh, extreme situations. We, we observed that telecommuting is becoming a, a factor in some of the households' residential location choice, but not all of them. So another way of putting this is we, we observe heterogeneous uh, telecommuting behavior for, uh, from the respondents. And despite having transit share dropping 24%, we observed that people still consider uh, proximity to transit a bias, a, a bonus to, to making their uh, future residential relocation. And we also observed that there is a trend uh, towards detached houses in greater Toronto area, but we could not check if this is uh, more or less than whatever it was before, because we did not have any data for before that, which is comparable to our study. So overall, we could say people are more inclined to detach houses, but we could not say if the pandemic has increased or decreased it. Second cycle can help a little bit more on knowing what's happening here. Uh, and also we realize that residents of uh, urban areas are less likely to relocate to urban areas in their future relocation choices, especially the uh, condo dwellers uh, were less likely to move it in a condo in an urban area. And lastly, we observe that residential dissonance is increasing. Uh, residential dissonance is a state where there's a mismatch between uh, the present household's residence and the residence they would prefer to live in the future. Uh, residential dissonance can influence um, travel demand in two ways. First is the direct way, the person who is not happy with their residence go to the market, change the uh, residence and start adapting a new lifestyle. There's an also an indirect effect when that person continues to live in that uh, old residence, but it starts to adopt uh, tra uh, travel choices, short-term travel choices that is more similar to a person who is living their preferred uh, residence. And that was the background of the first cycle. Um, let's talk about the main topic of this uh, presentation, which is uh, what we did for the second cycle and the challenges that we had to address. Well, uh, you remember that I, I talked briefly about orthogonality and why we, we have to balance things up to avoid being biased uh, to showing specific regions and dwelling types to the respondents. But what that, what, what that is causing is in reality, you will see that people, when they are making their relocation decision, they are not balancing things out. Some people are uh, looking into moving into condos into certain areas and us asking them every time that whether you prefer to go to a detached house or a townhouse or a semi-detached house or a condo is irrelevant. And the information we get out of that survey would not capture that, like the true and um, deeper preferences of that person. The, the information, the most information that we can get from this type of um, survey is that we can say this person is into condo du dwelling type, but we cannot say if how that person chooses between condos versus condos, because we balance things out 
for orthogonality in our SP design. This usually uh, gets addressed by, if, if, it, if this wasn't about location choice, and let's say it was about more choice, travel more choice, this is usually not a problem because we have we ended up ha we end up having all the more choices in the choice uh, um, set in the experiment design, and that person at the time of making choices is choosing between all of the options. But in location choice, a person might be into moving to Mississauga, and I'm showing them: Do you want to move to North York, Markham, or downtown? That is totally irrelevant to that person, and. This is being caused by heterogeneity, but is being intensified by being by having a large choice set. And the second and the third problem that we have in SP designs, econometric SP design in location choices, is when when a person is not choosing to relocate, we cannot associate that behavior. We cannot distinguish if that person is not moving because of a residential mobility phase meaning that if they like their current place or not, or it's a location choice, or that person wants to move, but we did not offer good choices to them. So they end up not moving. Uh, all the standard practices have this in them. And it's not commonly being discussed. Uh, the way that these heterogeneous behavior is being handled in our final modeling is through the random uh, coefficients that we use in mixed logit models. We assume that for certain factors, the behavior is not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous, it's, it, uh, it follows, it follows the, let's say, normal distribution, and we use pseudo random numbers to estimate and get consistent results out of that behavior. And we end up, in our models, we end up addressing different behaviors to different people. But in our data collection, we're totally forgetting that. Our data collection is merely based on the attributes of the uh, alternatives and not the persons. And the question that we had is, um, is there a way that we can apply the same concept of modeling, like associating different behavior to different people? Uh, and instead of like designing the SB based on uh, let's say a logit model, we put a mixed logit model, what happens in, if we do econometric on that, uh, the, the server design will, uh, will say, okay, you needed 1000 observations before number of samples. Now, because you have heterogeneity in your behavior, you need 5,000 because I'm increasing the number of uh, uh, experiments. We don't know which experiment to show to whom, we, we, all we know is that everything is random. We have to increase our, um, our events to meet the chance that we want to meet. So at the end of the day, using mixed logic models into uh, designing SP surveys, we only increase the number of sample that is needed and increase the cost. Our question was, with the same cost, can we do a more intelligent search of, of finding that which choice experiment we have to show to whom? We have to go through the, the deeper that what is happening in a choice experiment. Uh, we have uh, each person that is participating in our surveys have uh, two two different uh, preferences. They have pre latent preference. We call it latent because of the indirect effect that I talked about earlier due to residential dissonance. That you you cannot assume merely you cannot merely make assumptions like condo dwellers are more likely to go to condos because there is indirect effects of residential dissonance. So we, we have to see, observe them, we have to observe them at the moment they're making the decisions. We cannot go totally, we cannot totally go up front and ask them um, and or make, the, make assumptions based on their period uh, relocation behavior. And another thing is the second order preference. If you go directly to the person and ask, what do you, what do you prefer? Uh, second order, the definition of second order decision is second order preference is the options people prefer to prefer, but they don't actually choose. It's, it's where the ideas of people choosing. So if I go ask them, do you prefer dwelling type and condo? Everyone wants to go outside of the town, build their own castle, be super close to transit and highway and all the good things. So we could not be upfront about this 
either. And at the end of the day, uh, each person have their own utilities and we get that data, we put it into rows, we fit the model into one utility function and we observe that some of, some of the uh, parameters are showing uh, lower variances, we call them homogeneous and uh, some of them are larger, we call this heterogeneous. So in data collection, what we are basically doing we are grouping different types of people. We, we, we forget all the differences that they have. We make the choice design based on their, uh, based on the attributes of alternatives instead of, instead of those people. And we get that data in modeling practice. When we are feeding the model, we start to insert the socio-demographic variables to start to separate decisions based on uh, people's behavior and personalities, which is, not a very efficient way. And the idea behind efficient adaptive design that we designed for the second cycle is uh, we wanted to know, can we separate the one utility function that we had and we fitted all the behavior into that utility function? We separate, we, we make utility function for each person independently. And that utility function uh, designs the survey for that particular person. Well, uh, based on the time, I, I think I wanna skip this and go here. So the idea is we wanna personalize the experiment design. So instead of uh, me going before, one month before survey, go through previous designs and assuming a utility function and coming up with 18 predefined functions, what we did, we, uh, we said, we don't assume anything. We go to the survey, we ask questions. And once we got the answers from those questions, we start to design the experiment, the choice experiments real time. So what happened was in, rea in, in practice, we, we started in the, in the beginning of the survey, we asked people's current residents, we, we asked them wor their workplace, if they're going to school, we asked their, uh, educational institution position. And based on those, we have an initial guess of that, what might that person be into? We start our guesses, we observe them making their choices. And based on their choices, we update our knowledge on that person. And each scenario to another scenario, we update our choices and we come up with the choice sets and experiment designs that is more relevant to that person. Uh, we also could consider the neighboring effects. If, that, if a person is choosing certain regions, we could weight up the other regions around it. And uh, we also had to uh, consider something called revision factor that I'll talk about it shortly in, in calibration phase. Um, so uh, the, the algorithm that we, uh, we uh, we proposed for, for new SB designs is uh, we said, okay, if you want to do experiment design for um, location choice, it's better to go with uh, some, instead of going with econometric efficient SB design, let's do efficient adaptive design. First step is just going like, like efficient design, just pick your attributes and levels that you want you think it might be important to person that making decision. Second is um, try to, uh, based on, so we had the first cycle, so we, we could get ideas from the first cycle. Try to differentiate between the attributes you think that different people think about them differently and the attributes that you think, like everyone wants to go to a place that is 10% uh, lower in price. And they have like similar, like at the end of the day, everything is heterogeneous, but you can, you can start assuming that like you can, we're modelers, we're not, uh, we don't want to find the optimal solution. We want to see what's 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 happening on both sides of stories. What's being uh, so we want to have control on the survey. So we want to balance between efficient design and being adaptive and making survey survey personalized. So um, for uh, econometric design, uh, for for homogeneous variables, you do econometric efficient design like before, but for heterogeneous designs, you 
instead of having one utility function, you, you start to define utility function for each person. And the, the information that we have from that person plus the, the, the actions of that person during the survey will change the latent preference of that person's utility and subsequently change the probabilities of us introducing, presenting choices to them. And then we do Monte Carlo simulation to make our, uh, uh, make our surveys, um, experiments. And since there is a model on the background of server that is going on, we needed to do model calibration to, so model calibration means if I have a person who is uh, into condos, I have to, so I have initial guesses. I have to make sure that those guesses will uh, converge to that person's choice as quickly as possible because I, have, I don't have so much chances and I can't waste time on that. So model calibration basically here means I have to reach to that person's latent preference as soon as possible I can. So, this is the structure of efficient adaptive design. At the moment that person is answering, let's say the third scenario, we have anything before the third scenario, which means period knowledge, uh, information collected through scenario one, scenario two. We, we build our uh, utilities based on those. We do Monte Carlo simulation to make, uh, make the choice set in uh, the fourth scenario that person's gonna see. And when they submit their third, uh, scenario, we update our information, we do another modeling, and it goes back and forth like this. Uh, so in the calibration phase, what we did for this study, we had the first cycle. So we separated, uh, so dwelling type and uh, region was our heterogeneous, so for uh, heterogeneous factors, so for each one of them, we separated the cases in the first cycle that people chose to go to certain regions and dwelling types, we looked up that what are the factors that are affecting that. And for each one of them, we did interval estimation of the factors affecting that. And we, we started from the means, we, we started the pilot, we started to guess what are the, uh, what are the possible interests of that person. And we started to uh, see if what we think they like is actually what they like. And based on the difference that we are from what they're like, we move within the certain range that we have for ourselves. We, we change the parameters, we, we move uh, numbers a little bit up and down to come up with the, um, the best possible set of variables. Well, I wanted to talk, uh, tell you a little bit of story here, but skip that because I'm way behind schedule. And at the end of the day, the efficient adaptive survey design looks like this, which is very similar um, to what you saw before, but it's, it's personalized. Now, if you see this, it's probably for someone who's into Pickering region and already living in a semi-detached house. And, in, and since we, we are in interaction with that person, we can give them realistic prices for their budget and realistic areas for their areas. So it's overall, the survey is more personalized and that's the whole idea. Uh, flashback to challenges uh, by this survey design, we um, address heterogeneity in behavior in region and dwelling type. Uh, we, we, did an, we, we did narrow our uh, large choice into choices that is relevant to that person, which means for each um, experiment on average, we're getting more bits of information and uh, since we are offering um, location choices that are relevant to that person, we are getting more, uh, so, so we can resolve the issue that we had. We did, we, if, if the person did not move before, we did not know if, if, we, if the options that we are offering is irrelevant or that person is really into their current location. So now that we know that the options that we are um, offering is relevant, we know when the person is not choosing to move, they like their own uh, residence right now. Uh, a little bit of evidence on what? Okay, 11.50, all right. I'll, I'll like go super fast on these. So remember I told SB, economic SB designs are orthogonal. 
and the blue lines are the first cycle designs. And in first cycle, we, we equally put everything in it. Uh, we had equal number of Mississauga choices and Markham choices and Halton choices and Etobicoke choices. And at the end of the day, you see those, um, those bars are very close to, to the mean. But in ad adaptive surveys, when, when respondents take control of their own choices, you see that it's way more flexible. If people are into North York, we're offering them more North York. We're not restricting it by assuming that everything has to be balanced. If people are not interested in Milton, we stop talking about Milton. And same goes for dwelling type. Uh, if you see left side, it's kind of equal. Right side, you see that people are really into detached houses. And one argument is that, so what if we are intensifying the, um, the choices of let's say if North York is going higher, is adaptive design is causing that, like giving more North York options to people so they are choosing more North York? So here we are showing no. On, on the choices that are higher than uh, average, we are offering less than they are choosing. And for choices, like Milton totally shows this. We are keep trying Milton to see if people really want to go there or not, but people don't want to go to Milton. So we can secure, we can confidently say that people are not into going to Milton. And another interesting thing is uh, for left side, uh, you see the, the number of times people decided to move uh, and it, or in another way that I can say it, what scenario did people normally choose to go? And, and the left side, everything was balanced again, balance, the chance of moving in scenario nine is as equal as it is in scenario one. But in scenario, uh, in, in the right side, you see a learning effect that the survey is learning people uh, preferences and it's adapting its, its options to those preferences. And after all, a first cycle second versus second cycle, uh, we, um, I have to make this a little bit shorter. Okay, I'll do it this way. So uh, the take away from how the relocation behavior changed during the pandemic, I can give you in two words. First, we have instantaneous effect. Second, we have lag effect. What is instantaneous effect? Is at the time that uh, extreme case like pandemic happens, people uh, do not make any uh, decisions in location, in terms of location choice. They, they wait, they see what is going to happen. They wait until things get certain and then they make the, their decision. What happens in instantaneous phase is the res residential di dissonance starts to change and people become, um, they, they start to think if they really like their current residence or not. And after things get back to normal, we have the lack of it. All of those in uh, cumulated, uh, residential dissonance starts to pop out and people start to go out and make their uh, residential relocations. The thing is, if the pandemic was longer than it was, we had a bigger jump in uh, relocations after the pandemic. And if it was shorter, we had a short, like a less jump. So the idea of comparing the first and second, I did not go through the details of it, but the overall finding was there is a lag effect of relocation choice. Um, 1153, I won't talk about this. I won't talk about this. And let's talk a little bit about modeling a minute. Now that we have a different type of data that considers that people's actions during the survey and prior knowledge, we can, instead of just assuming that people will have mixed random uh, error, which is following normal distribution, we actually know the distribution now. We, we, we search the latent preference of that person during the survey and we know how that person, in what category that person's biased. So instead of doing random uh, mixed logit models, random component mixed logit models, we can, we can move from frequentist approach to Bayesian approach where, where we see that people have a state of knowledge and based on that knowledge, they start to make their choices. And as that knowledge gets updated, the choices becomes different. So at the end of the day, 
the problem that we had with simulation with mixed logic models that we had to randomize everything and we did not know who to assign to what behavior, uh, a model based on adaptive survey can, can uh, give you uh, more information on simulation that which person is going to make that particular decision. And today I talked about, um, well, when IT came to me and asked for me to do a presentation, I had like a couple of options. I, I, I thought about this would be more relevant to the audience. Uh, unfortunately, the Zoom is not working. I don't know who's watching this, but I can say at some point, if you're doing transportation at some point, chances are you have to do a survey. And I want my, I want my audience to think that are we, are we still in a paper, uh, paper era that all the surveys were conducted in papers and people answered in papers? Are we really taking advantage of the survey side? Because all of the idea was uh, practical because we could do all the calculations and modeling in our surveys at, in our servers at the time that people were answering the questions. And this is not only for location choice. We can, we can do, like the sky's the limit on this. We have server side, we can analyze data in the server side and we can somehow personalize uh, our surveys to people's to get more information. The goal, the overall goal is more information. And i um, uh, done with this presentation. I see Osman <laughs> turn on his uh, camera, but I'm, I'm only presenting this on behalf of uh, the research group. Um, um, if anything was interesting about this survey is because of, um, it's probably because of the ideas I, I got from Professor Habib and uh, Professor Jason Hawkins now. And if anything was unclear, simple, it's probably me and me failing to deliver it. So um, thanks everyone for paying attention. And I'm sorry if I was super slow in the, be in the beginning and super fast in the, at the end. Thank you.